maybe one of you in here may get to come back here and play at Wembley again. Boy, let's don't come and stand outside our supplies and all them things there now that he's a footballer. It's always been a motivating factor for me. Aye, so we end up changing to serve you. Yeah. Family was broken, my mum and dad was broken. Yeah, Do you know I what hear mean? you. But we can sometimes use that as an excuse. I know what, I know what the gesture means. Yeah. I know, I understand it. How long are we gonna take the knee for, son? The one thing in this world is you're not better than anybody else in this world. And no one else is better than you. So just treat everybody with respect. And that's always been a, a, a big thing with me. It not only shaped me as a footballer, but it shaped me as a man as well. And I always remember seeing Bruce Rioch uh, afterwards, and he said, probably the worst decision I ever made in my career, uh, managerial career, I was offered you and I didn't take you. Whoa. We say, Liz. I'm good, man. I'm good. It's How such are you? a pleasure, brother. Seriously, like having you coming down, knowing that I haven't known you for like a long stretch of time, um, but I'm connected to you. I'm feeling you because um, you, you're 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 one of the man them, as we say on the road. You're one of the man them. Um, you know what time is. You're down to earth. When I first saw you in like we must have been in some VIP section at Queens Park Rangers after some game. Um, I actually wanted to, to talk with you in that. And I kind of got to chat with you, but when I finished, I was like, what, what, what's, what's Les on, man? Like, where, it felt like, like I didn't make a connection. It felt like, what's going on? Didn't Les want to talk to me? <laughs> and, and I kind of came away like, oh, oh, no, I thought that would have went better than that. But I didn't allow that feeling to stay with me. I didn't allow that feeling to stay with me. So when I saw you again and we linked again, it was way better. It was really nice energy. And I was like, oh, cool, cool, cool. I'm glad I didn't just, cause you know, some people when they meet people the first time, they just say, nah, man, my man, you know, he's this and he's that and he thinks he's all that. They do that and then don't give the person a chance. Cause you don't know what's going on. Yeah. You don't know what days had, you don't know nothing. And cause it's the first time you've met them you really don't know what their day's like. And, and you can't presume because it didn't go how you thought it was going to go that they don't like you. That's the story that we tell ourselves. Yeah. Oh, nah, man, he's this and they give... So, cut a long story short, bruv. I love you. I'm so grateful that you come down. Um, and basically, I just invited you down and you came, bro. Yeah, I know. You know what? So, uh, just saying that, it's one of, the, one of the stories my granddad always used to say to me. He was saying, like, you, 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 never, say, you never say hello to someone. You never, you never say... Um, good day or whatever to someone because you think they are somebody or they've got status. Mm. You say mm. it because it's the right thing to say. Beautiful. And he said, and what you got to understand is on the day of you saying it, you don't know what that day that person's have. So you might say good morning to someone and they go, mm, and they walk past you. That's it. You don't know what, what they've been through, but you say it the next day as well. That's it. And if after the next day they do the same thing, then you might, then you That's know, you might, have a, you might have a problem. Do you know what I mean? Because like as man. you said, you never know what day you're going through. And when I met you in the VIP part, part of QPR, it could have been after a game. We That's might have it. lost the game, and Thank you don't know you. where my head was. Where Easily. Was. Yeah, and that's, that's it. you know what I mean? That's, yeah, that's But you're just a beautiful guy, bro. Mm -hmm. you know? And I'm not just saying it, because <laughs> this is the whole truth. I can't yeah. come on my platform with the truth and start chat some bullshit, bro. I can't do that. <laughs> so I've got to keep it real with you. I've got mad love for you. Hey, when I'm really, really connected with you is when we had that talk, when I came down to do the first team talk, and we were reasoning, and you had your guy that you'd known from when you were young, and he was on the team with you, and, and I saw some stuff about you from then, like, you don't forget your, your, your brothers, you don't forget the people that you came up with, and that's really important to me, that someone's genuine, and they're true to themselves, because a lot of the times people move up, and we're from the roads, and we kind of feel like, yeah, you know, I've moved up to this point, and you, you, you tend to forget the people that you've come up with because, you know, you feel that you're someone or you're a celebrity now and whatnot, and you kind of start having a new clique of friends and you leave your people behind, but the true, genuine, truthful people to themselves always have their real friends from whatever walk of life because you know them, you trust them, you understand them, they understand you. And it's never that, that celebrity status mm -hmm. thing, it's always just being genuinely you. Yeah. And um, I love that about you when I met 
this guy that you'd been with and now we Keith. Yeah, Keith. Yeah, Keith. Good, good. Boom, Keith's a good yeah. friend and we went to school together. But, you know, I went to school with many other, other guys as well who, yeah. you know, I come from a council estate. And if you went back to that council estate and met all the guys, yeah. because we all came from the council estate, don't mean everyone still stick together. People have gone off and That's some have it. got married, some are living abroad, yeah. some are doing what, you know. Very true. So, there's only one or two, you know. You, That's we, right. People say you go through life and you can count the amount of friends you got on one hand. Correct. I'm That's usually true. And that's, some of that might be from your past. Mm -hmm. Some of that might be from, you know, journey. my footballing days. You know what yeah. I mean? Just the journey that you go on. So mm -hmm. I, when I was young, I always used to hear people say, oh, that guy got rich and switched. Mm -hmm. And then what I realised is it wasn't him that got rich and switched. Mm -hmm. People's attitude changed yeah. to him. Do you know what I mean? Because Aye. they felt he had a bit of status or whatever it. it was. They saw him differently. Yes. He didn't see himself differently. Say that again. And bro. when I came out of when I when I when I when I became a professional footballer, it was yeah. one of the things that I was really aware of, and I still wanted to be, mm -hmm. um, I still wanted to be that kid from the council estate. Mm -hmm. But my life had changed. That's right. I, mean, I remember years ago, and you probably remember the place. There, there used to be, on 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 Uxbridge Road. There used to be a, a place called a House of Pies. Mm -hmm. right? Yes, yes, <laughs> on, yes. On the Uxbridge Road, yes. many many years ago. And, you know, I used to knock around with some boys. And on the way home, after we'd been out or whatever, you stop in a house of pies, you get some chicken and chips or whatever it may be, and, and then you go on yeah. about your business, yeah. even when we was younger. Uh, but it was never a place that I hung outside. Hey. I'd go in there, buy my food, and I, I was yeah. never one of those guys that just stood outside of the premises and yeah, stood there and, 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 and quatched and gone, right, we're staying here yeah. for a while. And No, I just went and got my food, and we, we yeah, went on. Because men bed. used to do that outside. There. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then when I, when I got into football... I know one of the guys said to me, because even, that, you know, that Keith, mm. um, one of them said to him, boy, let's don't come and stand outside our supplies and all them thing there now that he's a footballer. And I said to him, when I wasn't a footballer, I wasn't coming and standing outside the house of pies. Now I'm a footballer. That's what you want me to do. Mm. To, to show that I'm still one of the boys. Yeah. If that's no. how you think. You think that way, you know what yeah. I mean? I've got things I need to do in life, you know what I mean? Places I want to go, things I want to do. Yeah. Standing outside the highs of pies wasn't what I wanted to do when I was a kid. So, so why, nice. because I'm a footballer, I'm going to do that now? Nah, just Beautiful. to show that I'm one of the boys. Nah, Beautiful. Nah, nah, nah. I know yeah. who I am in my heart, you know what I mean? So where that come from, though, bro? Where that come from, like, because you're being you. Because as I'm talking with guests, I'm finding out something about them, and it, there's, like, successful people, they seem to have things in common. And one of them is taking ownership of being them. Like, they ain't trying to follow others. And I think that as we go through these podcasts, the truth is that young people are going to see that, bro, you've got to be you. Yeah. You can't be following everybody else. So it'd be nice to, for you to look at, where, where, where's that from? Is that, do you think that just come from you as a person? Do you think it come from the way that your dad spoke to you, your mum, your upbringing? Because everyone in the ends is doing their thing. Hundred uh, percent, it's part of my upbringing. You know, like okay. my granddad was a was a good tutor. Awesome. You know, and I listened. You know, I had so much respect for my granddad, my dad, and my mum, and so much respect for them. So when they used to tell me things, you know, as, as you young people, you, mm. you, 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 your parents tell you things. You, yeah. yeah. And my granddad was like I said. You know, when my uh, my granddad moved back to St Lucia, and I used to go back every year, and I'd just sit there, me and him playing cards, just me and him talking. Mm -hmm. He always used to say, "Son." The one thing in this world is you're not better than anybody else in this world and no one else is better than you. So just treat everybody with respect. Yeah. And that's always been a, a big thing with me. Everybody I come across, I, 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 I treat with the respect that I want them to give me. If they don't give it to me, then I'll yeah, go and cool. do what I've got to do, but I'll always treat people with respect awesome. and, and, that's, and that's just be, that's the motto I live by. So as you kind of went up, did you see yourself and did you ever think, did it get to you like, I'm raising up the bar now, I'm on TV now, I'm this now, I've got these deals now. Did it, did, did it, what did it change in you? Never, Bless. never, I, I, don't, I don't think it changed, it, it, it changed the way I lived. Okay. Because I was able to have things that I dreamt, you know, I could only That's dream it. about as a kid. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So it changed, it changed my status in terms of what I was able to afford to buy. Okay. But I don't think it changed me as a person. And I think if you spoke to my friends and... And probably one of the biggest compliments, I say one of the biggest compliments, a compliment I had from a few of the guys that I grew up with because mm. they used to come and watch me up in Newcastle and all that. Nice. And I, I asked them the question, I say, what mm. would you say has changed about me? And they go, no, nah, man, you're still the same old Les that you was when you were. And that, and, that, and that made me feel good. Like you know you feel I mean? proud, because, Yeah, it? because, like I said, I don't think I'm better than anybody. Mm. 
Mm. Um, but I don't think anyone's better than me either. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's just the mutual respect, and and my parents have always taught me um, you respect you respect others, mm. um, you appreciate others, um, in a way that they respect and appreciate you. And, yeah. And that, and that's all it is. My family have kept my feet firmly on the ground. Beautiful. You know, when I go back to you know when we had family parties and I go back, it weren't Les Ferdinand the superstar yeah, turning right. up. It's just Les, it Les is turning up. You know what exactly. I mean? So. You know, there was no way of that. There was no way I was going to get above my station. Mm, no doubt, the family is mm. important to keep you grounded in it, bro. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Bring us into the journey. Give us ringside tickets, <laughs> and and take me from that journey of how you felt at school. Because like for me, I, I I do I love talking to my guests about being young mm. and growing up. Because I think that's where all the issues lie. That's where all the problems come. That's where all the fears are from. That's where everything derives from when you're young. Mm. So unless we understand how you come up, how you felt, the experiences you went through, and the things that, that moulded your mind, then we're not really going to understand Les. Yeah. So let's, let's just keep this 100. Tell us about the journey and the things along your journey that started to mould your mind, change your mindset. Um, you know, crowds and um, the business of football, um, the, the, the foundation you're talking about with parenting and experiences you went through during your life that helped you to become a better person. You know, all these things, bruv. Let's just start the journey. The journey, you know, well, well, I suppose from, you know, I come from a one-parent family. You know, my mum brought me up. I always knew my dad, always knew where he was. My dad, um, you know, unfortunately, my mum and dad split up, but yeah. I was close to both of them. Um, saw my dad at the weekends, saw my grandparents. Um, they were a massive influence on my life. But growing up, I grew up on a council, you know, the, the, the Grenfell Tower where that, that was. Yeah. I grew up on that estate, yeah. you know, um, as a kid. I uh, run around. My childhood was great. Loved yeah. my childhood. You know, we had, we had we just, I was just talking outside to the guys about, you know, when I was growing up, we had youth centres. So you go and play table tennis, mm -hmm. you go and play pool, snooker, football. So you weren't getting your ass whooped. So, so no one kept my ass whooped. No, man. I wasn't, I wasn't on the street. It's, it's very different now. Yeah. You know, but, um, yeah, we had our group of friends and there was rival groups over there and yep, stuff yep, like that. But yep. it, weren't, it weren't in the way that it is now where people are carrying guns and knives and stuff like that. It was none of that sort of stuff. 60s, 60s you, yeah? Yeah, I was, I was born in the 60s, but, you know, I went through the 70s and uh, 80s and stuff like that. And, you know, the truth is, you know, I was I went to school, probably didn't do as well at school as I should have done. Um, came out of school, went on to YTS schools. I don't know, I just um you know, you know now that I read up read up on it and, and, and listen to, to quite a lot of things, I know school ain't really designed for young black boys in the way that they're taught. Um, the the lessons that you're taught and the way that you're taught is not really designed for us. Um, it's unfortunate, but that's just the way it is. That's the way it has been. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and Did you find different treatment but for you and for your white counterparts yeah, in school from yeah, teachers? Cer certainly, certainly was. And my, you know, but I went to, I wouldn't even say predominantly black school because it was it was pretty mixed mm -hmm. culturally. You know, we had Indians, we had we had white, we had black. You know, we, it was it was pretty it was a pretty mixed school. Nice. Um, and amazingly, it was just around the corner from 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 QPR. You know, so I used to pass the stadium every every day um, it, it, to not and from school. Not knowing that, yeah, not knowing I'm that gonna be in here because they're going to be singing my name. You know, back back in the day, I never even thought I was going to be a professional footballer. Ooh. I never, I never ever, you know, listen. I love watching thought football. I love playing football, but never ever thought mm. I was going to be a professional footballer. Up to what age? Well, I, I didn't, I didn't get into uh, professional football till I was nineteen. Yeah, I did. And, and, and when obviously you were playing football like every yeah. other kid. Yeah, I was playing. So did, did other kids know it said Les is good? I'm gonna pick Les. You're on my side. Yeah, yeah, I had all that. But okay. Yeah, but you know, I could, I could take you to 10, 20 of my friends that had that as well. Okay. Who they would, you know, we yeah, were the, we were the best players, and people wanted them in, yeah. in your team, even your Sunday side. Your, you know, when I came in here, George said to me, oh, "You played in the Greek leagues." So that, I, I did, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? I yeah, used yeah. to play, I used to play non-league awesome. football for Sa South. George, on a by Saturday. the way, is the guy that just he just designs and and builds all this yoga group, yeah. these premises and. It's fantastic, man. Yeah, it's so, fantastic yeah. facility. But yeah, so he was talking to him and he said to me, Oh, you've played in the Greek League? And I said, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I used to play uh, non league uh, football on a Saturday yeah. for South Hall and on a Sunday, playing the Greek League and with my mates and Brilliant. stuff like that. And, Brilliant. and, and, and just in, in, I was just why didn't enjoying you think, football. Why didn't you think you was going to get, if you, you knew it was good and you were playing and you enjoyed it? It was really weird because um, 
when I when I first started playing, I was um was at school mm. and there was a group of um just trying to think. There was probably about seven or eight of us joined this non-league team, probably non-league semi-professional team called Viking Sport. Mm -hmm. Right, and I always remember going going there the first time and seeing dugouts and oh, all like that. Group of and, bad boys. and then it looked like yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it looked like um, you know, real professional setup because it had dugouts and all that. And I was like, yeah, man, we want some yeah, of this. Guessed. So we was playing for the youth team, and it was like, like I said, seven or eight of us from the same school going and playing, and we had a very good uh, school team at the time. Cool. So most of those boys got together and we we, we joined this this team. And it was really weird, but slowly but surely, those numbers started to dwindle. So we went from Viking Sports and then we went to Southall, right? By the time we went to Southall, there's probably five of us. Wow. Right? So two, three dropped out. The journey of life, eh? Yeah. And then, so like we, went, we, we started playing for the youth team, doing quite well. You go and start playing for the reserves and then up into the first. Sorry, how old are you around this time? So around about this time, when I started playing for Southall Reserves, it was probably about 14, 15. Okay. Yeah. So then I'm... Um, Start playing for the uh, youth team, and then I got into the I got into the South Hall first team quite young. I was about seventeen when I got in there, so I had a couple of years in the youth team and playing a bit of reserve team football. Then went into the first team. By the time I got to the first team, I was out of that group of guys. It's probably the only one. Wow. Yeah, still going. Wow. And then so then I kind of like there was a few guys that were older than me, peers that came from. Uh, Shepherds Bush as well. One guy we had called Bruce Rowe, who, when we was at school, we thought, in no shadow of a doubt, he's going to be a professional footballer. The little black guy called Bruce Rowe, who was, um, you know, a talented footballer, was playing for the first team. We had another guy called Randy Richmond, uh, Grant E. Did you see him more talented than you? Sorry? Did you see him as a more talented baller than you? Yeah, because, uh, you know, at school, he was on the books of Southampton. And everybody was just talking about this guy. Wow. Everybody but everybody. So, yeah, you look at him and you think, yeah. And, and everything about him, re professional footballer. Mm -hmm. Because cause he was, uh, I suppose, because he was at Southampton as a, as, a, as, a, as a youth player, he was already seeing the professional side of things and how it was done. Yes. So everything he did was on a, a, a more professional level than what, what we was doing, you know what I mean? So, anyway, I was... I was um, I was playing football at Southall. We'd get to a final. I remember getting to the final with Viking Sport. My dad came into the game and, and the, the manager saying to my dad, your boy's got talent, you know, your boy's got talent. If he takes this seriously, he's got talent. Then I went to Southall. We got to finals and we come. Where, where was you playing around this time on the pitch? I was, I was centre forward. Believe yeah. it or not, at school, when I played for the school team, I decided to go in goal for, for three, three years of my life. Right, Ooh, for, for whatever reason, goalless. and I think you know what it was. It was like you know when you see the goalkeeper with the gloves and everything else. I was like, yeah, man, I like, I like, I like the idea of these. You know, what I mean? yeah. so I put them on and used to get these gloves that had like almost like um, rubber bits on the yeah, front and it. the back. You know what I mean? And so that's when it. he kept, oh, nice. so I had, I had three years. So of he was like, always standing up in the middle where there's that muddy patch. Yeah, exactly. I, hated yeah, that patch. <laughs> I probably played goalkeeper at school as well. I hated that patch. Yeah, right. so I did that for a few years and then I went out on pitch and, and, and started playing and scoring goals. I remember I used to play five a side against uh, Dennis Wise, um, Bobby Dixon. There was a group of boys that yeah. used to go to my school and I used to play five a side wow. on a Friday night at the Harrow Club. And all of them went, well, we know Les can play up front, you know, because he plays up front okay. and the five side never played in goal then. Yeah. And then we had a reserve goalkeeper, but we didn't have a reserve centre forward. And I remember playing in my first game on pitch for the school, scoring a hat-trick, and the year master went to me, you ain't never playing in goal for the school again. Right, oh, so that wow, was, so yeah, now was out, that. Yeah, so now mm. I was out on the pitch and I was scoring and I was playing. And then, like I said, went to, went to, to Southall and was scoring goals there. Finals and my dad would come to the finals. I used to play um, five sides in St Mark's Park in uh, in, in Labour Grove there, and my dad would come to the finals every at time he came. At this point, do you get it yet? No, at this point, you know, I knew, I knew I was a good footballer. I knew I was a, at, at, at kids' level. I knew I was, I was a good footballer. Scored goals and everything. I was, had a powerful shot. I was, you know, I knew I was a good player. Yeah. But I never ever saw myself, and probably because at the time, I couldn't really. There was. There wasn't many black players that I could see on the TV to say, okay, right, you know what, this like you, that I you could, could aspire to. Exactly. You know what I mean? So mm. I was just playing. And so then what are you I, thinking? Because you're, you're like 16, 17 and that. What are you thinking you're going to be? What are you thinking you're going to become? What do you think you're going to do? So what I was doing, I was uh, from a very young age, from about 
13, 14, I used to do Saturday jobs. Right. Okay. So I started off doing a milk round yeah, with the easy the, yeah, to to like uh, we, you, we I lived on a, a big estate, so the milkman used to come in and I used to do the whole estate with the milkman and blah blah blah. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember the and milkman. Then, and the airman, I used to get a few a few quid and it just kept me going. So I weren't having to rely on my mum to give me pocket okay. money and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. So I was trying to do all kinds of odd jobs and then I and then I went to there was a garage just across the, in Latimer Road, just across the road from the estate. I went in there, started doing steam cleaning on a Saturday for this guy, which is. Doing, you do taxis, you do the underneath of taxis and the engines, you clean them and, and spray them and stuff like that. So I was doing that to, to make myself a few quid. And then um, the guy, I'd been doing it for years, and the guy said, look, you know you've got a job here when you leave school. Yeah. So straight away that was like money. It was just money, I need to earn money. Do you know what I mean? So I was out of, of, out of school and went into to, to earning money. But all the jobs I did allowed me to go and play football, train on a Tuesday evening and Thursday evening, play on a Saturday. So I couldn't have a job that let, wanted me to, to, to work yeah. on a Saturday. Yeah. So that's what I was doing. And then, um, and then I thought, when I, I, was, I was 17, 18, and then I thought to myself, nah, this is not what I want to do for the rest of my life. So I, I, I enrolled on a, a YTS. It was when the YTS yeah, scheme I'm first came out, right? Yeah, so I enrolled, training schemes. Yeah, exactly. I enrolled in one of them. And um, I was, was going to do computer repairs because that was the thing that was coming into... into into everyone's mindset for computers and stuff like that. Yeah. So I thought if I can get on a, on a, it, on yeah. a course. Computers were changing the game. Exactly, it was changing, life was starting to change and everything was becoming um, computers. So I thought if I can get on a computer course, bang. And life's very, very strange. I, I enrolled on this course and there was electronics, there was quite a few different things that you could do on, in, this, in this building at the Harrow Club at the time. And I, I turned up the first day and, and everybody went to their different sections. And before we started, the geezer did a speech and he said, like, OK, welcome, your, your YTS course is going to run for 18 months, or two years, whatever it was going to be. And you're going to go through these different phases. Uh, and he went, but the, the, the one problem there is that the computer repair um, teacher is not, back, is not here yet and he'll be here in a couple of weeks. So he was like, OK. So I was going in every day, yeah. but not doing anything. Waiting for uh, waiting for the tutor to come in. So after a couple of weeks, they went, look, we've had a real problem with the guy that was supposed to be starting the job. Blah blah blah. It's going to be another couple of weeks. So I'd, I'd already done a month wow. in this on this course. Yeah. YTS, you could waste a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. it was so, rubbish. And that's what I was doing, just wasting time. <laughs> so then a job came up where it was uh, driving a van for a painting and decorating firm and doing some painting and decorating. Mm -hmm. I thought. Mm -hmm. Listen, I've just got to go and do that, and then maybe I can enrol on this course next year okay. when they've actually got the tutor in. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. Uh, but in the meantime, I was carrying on playing Doing Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, and then we got to a final, uh, a youth final. Played well, scored some goals, and I always remember the the manager saying to my dad, "Do you know what? If your son will take this seriously, he's got every chance of, of, of making it as a professional." And at the time, I'd heard there was loads of like. There'd been clubs that were looking, but nothing had come to fruition. So, you know, I just saw it as clubs had been looking, but no one ever spoke to me, no one ever said anything. It was just, it was just that. And how what was your feedback from your dad? My dad. Them days, their parents are like, Mine for be a doctor. And yeah. like, and my dad was, it was like no football. My dad was <laughs> my dad said to me, he, he put me to sit down, he said, Listen, son, he said, everywhere I go, everyone says that you're a good player and you've got ability to become a professional footballer. They think you've got what it takes. Yeah. He said, why don't you give it your best shot for a year? And he said, when I say give it your best shot, don't turn up late, make sure you're at every training session and just take it seriously for a year. And if after a year you've your given it your best shot... My dad said this to me. He said, if after, if after a year you've given it your best shot and it doesn't work out, at least you can say you've given it your best shot. But at the moment, it looks like you're playing around with it because you're going off to play football on a Sunday. You're playing football here, you're playing football. Why don't you take this, this place serious for a year? And I said, OK. Um, so I kind of like, this was just before, yeah, this was, I was 18. Mm -hmm. And so I played for Southall. And in that year, we got to the FA Vars final, right? <laughs> and played at Wembley. Yeah. Right. So as a, a non-league amateur player playing at Wembley, the old Wembley, big what it teams. was, it's big things. And I always mm. remember we, we got to we got to the final, was in the in the change rooms and the manager turned around and he said, he said, Look, um we I want you guys to enjoy the day. We're here to win a game of football, I want you guys to enjoy the the, the day because 
maybe one of you in here may get to come back here and play at Wembley again. But the majority of us, this will be the only time you ever come to Wembley, unless you're going to pay and come through the door and watch England or, or, or watch your team play in a cup final. And so we're all looking round now, looking, thinking, because we had some good players yeah, in yeah. the team and you're looking at, is it, it's going to be him. You? No, you wouldn't even say me. <laughs> you was looking at him, was it him? Okay. Is it going to be him? Is it okay. going to be, is it gonna be him? Mm -hmm. and, and so that was what was going through everyone's mind. I remember we got beat 3-1 in, in the final. And, um, and, that, and I thought, wow, you know what I mean? This is what you dream about as a, as a kid playing at Wembley. Because you always used to watch the cup final, yeah, no matter sweet. what happened, FA Cup final. And you used yeah. to see it when it was at the hotel, on the coach, all the mm -hmm. way to, to mm -hmm. Wembley. So, yeah, and we was going, well, you know, I remember being in the bath, the big bath afterwards and everything. Yeah, yeah. So then, yeah, that was done. And, and, and then the team disbanded after that because we were made some promises by the club. The, the, the club didn't fulfil their How promises. Did we lost, we lost 3-1 in the final. Okay. But after the, the you know, we, we had a good, a really good little, a, the core of a really good little side. Mm. And thought to myself, oh, well, it's disbanding, what am I going to do? And then I remember through the summer, I was thinking, where am I going to go and play football? And I wasn't the most confident kid to just go and turn up somewhere and go, you know, this is, yeah, I'm just going to turn up there and see if I get a chance here and all that. And then fortunately for me, I got a call from the manager, Hayes who was a then manager, and they just lost their centre forward to, um, to Willstone, Harold Willstone. And he said to me, look, he goes, Les, we, we've watched you for a few years now, we've just lost our centre forward. We'd love for you to come in and do pre-season and we'd love you to play for us. So I was like, wow, OK. So first day of pre-season... How old? I was uh, 18. Cool. So f first day of uh, pre-season, I went and I said, oh, I've got a mate of mine who played with me at, at Southall, mm -hmm. Bruce Rowe, the same guy that I was yeah. talking about. I said, you know, we had a good partnership as a, as a, as a centre-forward pairing. And he goes, yeah, yeah, we know Bruce. He goes, yeah, bring him along if you want, you know, bring him along. Um, so he came along and started playing. And so this was like two divisions above where I was playing before. So Southall was the division two, this was like the Premier. So anyway, went there, started playing and started scoring goals. And so I think people, it's kind of like seen that I'd scored goals at that, that at uh, the South Hall level, which was yeah, li li level and two, and now I'm scoring goals in the Premier. And then I started to get more, this, the, the, the rumour mill started going again, that teams were looking at me, teams were looking at and me. And what's going on in here at the time with you? Just, just me enjoying football, really just enjoying playing non-league football still. Did you know why you were scoring more goals at the time, even when the levels went up? No, I just, just carried on playing how I, I knew I could play. It wasn't so there like, was nothing you I were saying to yourself? No, nah, it wasn't. You were just rolling with yeah, well, how it was going and uh, how things was at goals. the time. Okay. And I always remember sort of like um, my mate, one of my mates, this Bruce said to me, well, you scored the goals at that level and now you're scoring goals at, at this, this level as easy as you was at that yeah, level. Yeah. He was going, wow. And, and I didn't even think about that. Think I wasn't even it. thinking about it. I was just thinking, mm. playing football on him and enjoying it. Love it. And then we had, a, we had another guy called Earl Whiskey who uh, he was, as, as well as being a good, good footballer, he used to run a, a youth club in, um, in Shepherds Bush, top of Shepherds Bush, like Acton. Okay. And he worked at the time with... Uh, a guy out of QBR who was a scout called Bobby Ross. And he turned around and he said to this Bobby Ross, Bobby Ross was saying, you know, I work at QPR, you've got a white city estate across the road from uh, yeah. uh, QBR, thousands of young black boys, why do they never come support the team? And so my, Earl said to him, well, what do you do for the, the, the locals? You don't do anything. Most of our young boys that were at, Q, uh, were at our, our school, which is around the f corner from QBR, snapped up by Southampton. Mm -hmm. So he goes, well, you know, if, I, if we know there's any good players, he goes, well, we got a player at, at Hayes at the moment, Les Ferdinand. How many, how many times have you been to watch him? He goes, I'm going to make a point of coming to watch him. So he came to watch me on the weekend. He went <laughs> back and he said to QBR, right, there's a boy at Hayes, we need to go and watch, we need to keep an eye on. So then from then on, I, I started uh, most weekends, there was, a, there was uh, a scout there watching me. Then it went, and then uh, Brentford came in mm. and said, we want to sign in. I met Steve Perriman, who was the manager at the time. Who came in? Brent Brentford. Brentford, yeah. Came and said they wanted, they, they, they was interested. And what had happened was, when I was at Southall, we had a boy called Roger Joseph, who was right back. Mm -hmm. Roger went to Brentford. And so um, they'd always kept tabs and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And then they said, yeah, we, we were interested. And then 
QBR came in and said they was interested. And I was 19 and I was like, well, what do I do? You've got two clubs interested. Yeah, yeah, and you know, one was playing in the, in, in the first division, which would be the Premier League today, mm -hmm. and the other one was in the second division. Okay. So it was, it was a no-brainer. It was like, go and test yourself against the best son. Which gotcha. is what my dad said, and so and, and that's what was I did. that at the time. Sorry, who was that at the time? QPR. Yeah, QPR. So awesome. like you know, if you if you go to the the, the, the first division, i.e. the Premier League, and it doesn't work out, you've always got the second, the first, the second, and the third division. If you go to the third division, yeah, it doesn't work off, out. Where, where are you going to exactly. go? Do you know what I mean? Exactly. So um, I took his advice there as well, and um, ended up going to QPR and. Uh, it didn't that sound, your dad sound, he's always coming in with sound. Yeah, every now and then he's got a little sound bite, yeah, that's, um, that's no, a good one. He's had some bad ones as well, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, no doubt. but he's had a couple like of good dads ones. Do. <laughs> he's had a couple of good ones, yeah. and, and, and that was a good one. And, and like I said, I, when, I, when I first went to QPR, mm. it, it took a while for me to, you know, at one stage I'm looking at the Panini magazines and seeing all these professional footballers in there, and the next minute you're in there and you're thinking, well, you, you kind of feel like you're not worthy of what you're seeing because you wow. haven't gone through what these has got these guys have wow. gone through. So it took me a while to to really settle and understand where I was. And, and what about just embrace who you are becoming? Yeah, even then it was it was it was difficult because you're you're thrust into a totally different world. So what, what is, what's your belief system? What's it telling you? Because I'm hearing you saying that you know, well, these guys and you know, I don't maybe I don't belong at their level. Is that what your yeah, belief, belief system is telling you? Your belief system was telling you, am I good enough for this? Because okay. I'm now going in and seeing people that are doing things that you know, non-league football. It's, it's just a totally different wow, di different kettle of fish. And you're seeing guys do things and run in a way that I I ain't never seen before. And you think, am I capable of doing this? And so you start to doubt yourself. And oh, I, did, I, had, I, had that, I had those moments in, beautiful. in, 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 in my career. Because the man them need to hear. Yeah, people course, listening man. need to hear. There's people out there doubting themselves and thinking oh, whether, whether, you know, these people. We always think someone's better than us. Of course. Do you know course. what I'm saying? And we're not as good as that. You know, yeah. we want to sing, we want to do art, we want to start a business. We're always thinking that maybe, you know, I'm not as good as them. Yeah. And, and so you were going through that list. Yeah, and, some, and sometimes that is the case. Yeah. You're not, you know, because, you know, people want to be singers. Not everyone's going to be Beyonce. Yeah. Not everyone's going to be Luther Van yeah. Not everyone's going to be Barry White. But they can be mean, It doesn't mean you yeah, don't, you can't, you can't make you. it and be yeah. successful. Boom. You know, and, and so... Um, how do you deal with, how do you get through that? I know you obviously kept going. Yeah. But when did you begin to realise that was changing and confidence was building? I think that the, 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 the changing... Dynamic for me in, in all of this was when I went to Turkey. Yeah? I went to Turkey on loan. Um, most people go to... And, well, and where I is this, a, from QPR? From QPR. Oh, I, was, really? I went to... Um, I, had, I had a month at Brentford because I'd got to QPR and because Brentford were, had been interested yeah. and they knew that I wasn't going to play in the first team, they'd come okay. and they said, Let, let's take him for a month. So they had you on loan or something? Yeah, so yeah? Brentford took me on loan for a month. Oh. But I had a couple of injuries when I went there because my body was uh, adjusting to... And you'll know this, when you come from doing mm -hmm. amateur sport mm -hmm. to going into professional mm -hmm. sport, mm -hmm. your body takes a little bit of time Trust to adjust. Me, and then you start pulling things that you never yeah. even realised you yeah. had. That's you right. know what I mean? And that's, that's right. and that's what happened. In my, in my period of going to Brentford, I went through that where my body was changing and developing mm -hmm. and getting into the, into the, used to the rigours of professional football. Got you. So, um, kind of like, the, that wasn't probably a successful loan for me because I had a, a few injuries. But then after that... I was sitting around and I was still trying to get into this. Um, I'm here now, I'm a professional footballer. I've got to live, try and live a professional life. But I was still trying to be who I, who I was, the, the kid from the council estate, mm -hmm. and wanted the people to believe that that's who I still was. And then um, the opportunity came to, to go out to Turkey um, to, to go on loan for a year. And, um, <laughs> you know, things in life, I always say things happen for a reason. Yes, yeah. um, some things you can't control. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I say, well, you can't control them, you can control them, but some things are destined to happen. That's right. And I went, yeah, OK, I'll go, without knowing anything about Turkey. Why did you, you jump on that? Because I knew I needed to change something. And I couldn't ca continue to be doing... I couldn't continue doing the same thing and expect change. I needed, to, I needed to make a, a, make a change. Um, I couldn't, you know, just, if I'd have carried on Do doing the same thing... you know what change you was after? Yeah, because I, I wanted to be a professional footballer. I wanted to. I wanted to be the best I could be, and you, you don't think he was performing at that level no, at that time? No, nowhere near it. Nowhere near it. Beautiful. And so, 
um, the opportunity came to go to Turkey and I went, listen, what's the worst thing that can happen? And I, what I did, I, I always, I always kind of like look at things and I weigh up the positives and the negatives. And I go, what's the worst case scenario? So me going to Turkey, the worst case scenario is I go there, absolutely hate it, can't stand it. I jump on a plane and I come back to England and I'm sitting in my house and I can't play for anyone else because I've signed a year's okay. deal out there. So that, that's the worst case scenario. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's not me losing my life. That's not me any, any, okay. anything. It's just yeah. I don't play football for a year mm -hmm. for a professional club. Mm -hmm. I'll probably still be able to train, but I couldn't, I couldn't yeah. play. So that was the worst case scenario. What's the best case, best case scenario? Go out there, play football, play football in front of the crowds, get my confidence going mm -hmm. and, and, and come back a different person. That's exactly what happened. I went out there. Was not having been around your peeps and being around a different country kind of allowed you to feel more free and there was less pressure and that you put on yourself because you had these injuries and you're telling yourself all these things in your head? Yeah, 100%. Just Beautiful. um, not only did, did Turkey teach you... I always say to, going to Turkey was like my professional apprenticeship. You know, I didn't go for an apprenticeship like the normal um, player comes through a system, has an apprenticeship. Back then it was called an apprenticeship. You have an apprenticeship and then you, 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 you go into, into, into first-team football. Yeah. I never had that. I, I came straight from non-league football yeah. and signed as a pro. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I never really had that, gr that grooming as, a, as, a, as an apprentice. So going to Turkey, I always say, was my, my, my apprenticeship into, into football. Um, it taught me how to be a professional footballer because I was out there on my own. I, I had to grow up as a man. Wow. You know, I, I, start, I had to start cooking for myself, wow. uh, cleaning for myself, doing everything wow. for myself. Love it. And it sort so it, it not only shaped me as a footballer, but it shaped me as a man as well. So, so a lot of parents want to protect their children from going through these tough trials and tests and make life easy, but actually it's the opposite. It's actually allowing them to take risk, allowing them to have to take responsibility for themselves and go through things that you, you're not able to be there to rescue them from that difficulty and they learn how to get through life and they learn life skills. Yeah, exactly. You learn that. life skills, bro. Yeah, and you know, it was, it was tough. It was a tough time for me as well because my mum had uh, just got over her first bout of breast cancer. Wow. So, you know, it was a big decision wow. to, to leave and... Um, and go and I remember sort of like sacrifice. Yeah, and I remember while I was out there, she kind of like got went into her second bout of breast cancer. So it was tough to be away, but she was no, 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 son, you you do what you need to do. Awesome, um, I'll be okay, you know. So yeah, playing, playing, being able to play football and have mommy on your mind. Yeah, you know. So wow. it, yeah, so as I said, it was um, it was it was a massive thing for me, and but. It, it was the turning point in, in my footballing career because shaped you. I I left all my friends here, mm. went there, and f thought there's something I want to do in life. Mm. And sometimes you have to make sacrifices there here and go. there to get to where you want to go. It. And you um, and going out there just showed me a different kind of discipline. Um, you know. You know, you being in boxing, you know, yeah. at times you've had to be away from your family Trust when you're me. in camp and stuff yeah. for six weeks or whatever yeah. it may yeah. be. You know, I just did that for a year. Mm. And I was the first British player ever to play out in Turkey. Wow. Do you know what I mean? And being black as well. Yeah, <laughs> it was, like, it was, it was like, different. Like, my head's you know? just going yeah. around with stuff while you're talking yeah. to me. Like, we got to get into that experience, <laughs> bro. And, and you know what? The, the whole time I was there, I couldn't have been treated any better than... than, than for that real? I was. They absolutely. The Turkish absolutely, girls look after you, Les. It was. I was looked after by everyone. I mean, <laughs> by everyone. This is the whole truth, bro. Yeah, you don't have to be politically but, correct. But it, it, I, was look, I was looked after by everyone. Lovely, over there. It was bro. Like, it was. Um, it, it was. An, and I always, you know, I hold Turkey in my heart very fondly because, like I said, it was the making of me as a as a man, as and as a footballer. And um, always have fond, fond, fond memories of of going out there. See, and, see, we would think that. You're gonna get a harder time over in Turkey when you go over there than when you're over here. But yeah. in reality, did you? No, I didn't. Um, and that's that's pretty much because I think I was I was successful in what I'm doing. I was doing. I think had I gone out there and not scored the goals mm -hmm. and played in the way that I played, it might have been might a have tougher been time for me. It might okay. have been a tougher time for me. But the fact that I went out and from day one, and, and you know what? The, the, I think the biggest thing for me was when I went there, I didn't 
go there going, wow, this is not like London. Oh, this is not like England. This is rubbish. This. I just went and embraced. I just in, in, immersed myself in yeah. the culture. Yeah. In, immersed myself in the people and said, the one thing I'm going to do, is I'm not going to do is go can try to compare it to England. Brilliant. And, and London. So I just got myself immersed in what they yeah. were doing and how they were doing it. And, you know, that was... You know, and I think year? they adapted to that. They adapted that to me. Yeah, one year, yeah. One now, season. you come back to London. Uh, first, how did you get back? Your contract ended? Nope. Um, basically, I was out on loan. Okay. From, from QPR. So Got I was you. out on loan from QPR for You're a year. Long done. But I wanted to stay. Did you really? But it's such a good time. Yeah. I wanted to stay. I'll tell you a funny story because in, in Turkey, um, the Prime Minister and the whole country of football fanatics, right? So when, when, it, when it was uh, spoken about me staying, wanted to stay, um, we went and spoke to QPR. I, I remember the, the, the manager at the time was a fellow called Gordon Mill who was out in Turkey with me. Okay. Jim Smith was the manager at, at uh, QPR when I left. Mm -hmm. But in between that, Jerry, uh, Trevor Francis had taken over. Okay. So myself and Gordon Mill jumped on a plane, came back and said, look, He's had a good time out there. They really like him. They'd like to keep him. And Trevor was going, well, you know, we know he's been scoring goals. Um, unless the Turkish cow can pay half a million, is which, is which, what, is which what we'd be looking for, we're not going to let him go. Yeah. And that so, was big money. Yeah, it was big in, money in back then. And I was like, was this was... Yeah, early uh, 80s? This, 80s? No, this, no, this was, yeah, late 80s, so about 89. Mm -hmm. So he said, like, um, unless they can pay half a million... I got to come back, so we went back, yeah. and we, all, you know, myself and Gordon was disappointed um, that they weren't going to allow me to stay, and you know, I'd had such a good year and yeah. felt like I was going to, I was going to go get even better. And um, so, what the the Prime Minister of Turkey did was wrote to the Prime Minister, who was Margaret Thatcher here, you're kidding me, saying like, can she sanction that? I can. I was going, it don't work like that. In no, the I said, no, no. As much as it could happen yeah, in Turkey. Yeah, my big boy in Turkey. <laughs> Let me talk to the big boys over there. Yeah, so yeah. They, they, they tried going That's along excellent. them lines, you know what I mean? Thatcher must have cracked up when she read that. <laughs> I don't know so, about football. You're yeah. talking about Les Virgin. Exactly, you know. So, so I came back, but I came back with a a renewed confidence and, uh, and a, a, a new feeling of I belonged. You know, I belong awesome. here and I, I can do this. Can I've do got this. no problems. And I always remember... Belief changes everything, oh, Well, wow. Self-belief. So, 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 so powerful. So, so powerful. I came back and I remember by the time I came back, we had people like Peter Reid, um, Nigel Spackman, Ray Wilkins. Awesome. All these guys had come and joined the team. Brilliant. Timing. And, and I always remember Peter Reid saying to me, I remember... Um, our first day of pre-season coming in and we started doing some games and stuff like that and all of a sudden you pick the ball up and you run with it and I was going, fucking hell, who's this? Mm. Where's this guy come from? And he said, oh, he's been out in Turkey. Out in Turkey? Why hasn't he been here playing for us? Is what he said, like, just on <laughs> yeah. the first the yeah. first looking at me in, in training and stuff awesome. like that. And that was the renewed confidence. Yeah, and yeah. You know what? I, I, had, I had a couple of managers while I was at... at um, at QBR, Trevor Francis liked me. Don Howe was his number two, and the late Don Howe. And I probably had a, a bit of a clash of personalities with Don Howe oh, yeah. while I was there. Yeah. Um, it was this young black kid from an, a council estate who shouldn't really have an opinion, and I was one that did have an I opinion. And so say. there was, we, we kind of like got into loggerheads a few times. And that probably stunted my growth at QPR oh, for, a, yeah, for yeah. a period of time. Because didn't football have that sort of culture about it there? You know, the managers, coaches, they tell you, you know, how to behave, what to do, and you, you, you go along with it. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and I don't think I was ever obstructive. I just gave an opinion. Yeah. And sometimes that opinion, people didn't like that mm -hmm. opinion. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it probably stunted my growth in, in yeah. sort of like... And I used to say, just... I always remember now, he, he, the, the, the managing director of QBI, a fellow called Clive Berlin... Um, who is now, he's now an agent and I, I'm still in touch with him, still yeah. good friends with him. Uh, I always used to say, all I'm saying is give me a chance. Afford me the same chance that you afford someone else. Give me 10 games and if I'm no good, I'll hold my hands up and say I'm no good. And he used to laugh and he used to go blah, 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 and this, that and the other. Mm. And I always remember Don, uh, Don Howe, because we had this clash of personalities, tried to sell me for £250,000, right, to Millwall. 
Bruce Rioch was the manager at Millwall, Millwall at the time. Millwall? Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, you could tell he liked you. <laughs> right. So they tried, <laughs> to take, they tried to take Paul Goddard from Millwall and sell me to, um, uh, to Millwall for 250 grand. Mm. And I always remember seeing Bruce Rioch uh, afterwards and he said, probably worst decision I ever made in my career, uh, managerial career, I was offered you and I didn't take you. And wow. he said, and then I, and this is when I went on to, to start yeah. scoring goals yeah, and, and no, doing no. what I did at QBR. Yeah. And I always remember the QBR chairman, Richard Thompson, when I left QBR and went to uh, went to uh, Newcastle, he said Don Howe was the England uh, number two for a long period, mm -hmm. and this was a guy that was supposed to see talent, nurture it, and get the best out of it. Wow. He told this. He told me to sell you for two hundred and fifty grand. He would have cost this club 5.75 million pounds My because days. they ended up selling me for six million in the end at the, at the time. Wow! And that was just because. And I said to him, "Look, it was. I don't think it was a fact that." Don didn't recognise my ability. It's just we just had a clash of personalities, and sometimes so that happens in life. So it was more personal than yeah, anything then, else. Yeah, then it was then then it was about my ability. But this is a business. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, especially yeah, when yeah, you're yeah, in you charge play. of a club. Yeah, you're it's right. about making money for the club, mm -hmm. and it ain't about your personal feelings with another yeah. player. Yeah. So that was um. So that that's kind of like that was the journey to mm. to to come. And so anyway, after coming back, I had I, had, I remember Trevor Francis. I remember. I never thought I was going to play. You know, I was in and around the first team. My mum had become ill, and unfortunately, I lost my mum when she was 45. Oh, man. But, um, and that was, you know, I was, I was, oh, I always remember I was, I was traveling with a team to, and back in the day, we used to go by coach yes. everywhere. There yeah. was no trains, there was yeah. no planes, it was just coach. Yeah. So we'd be up north or where it was, and, you know, I wouldn't have seen my mum on a Friday because we we jump on a, on on a, on a, on a coach on a Friday, yeah, go yeah, to yeah. go to wherever hotel mm. it was, yeah. and then I'd be sitting in the stands. I wouldn't have even played. You know, I was I was like 13th man back then, 14th man. So wow. I sat in the stand, and then we we travel back. We wouldn't get back till 10 o'clock at the night. And I remember I used to jump in the car, drive around to the hospice, and I used to go. Like, I ain't seen my mum for a couple of days. Can I just go out for five minutes? Wow, and because yeah. she'd been in there for quite a while, and mm. I got to know the nurses and all that, That's I'd go, look, Les, you can have like five, ten minutes with her. So I'd go in and, and she'd go, what's going on, son? And I was to go, mum, like, you know, I mean, I've had to travel, I didn't play. And she, and she went, but look, son, trust me, you'll be OK in the end. You'll be all right. Don't worry, you'll be all right. So she never got to see me... Um, uh, she never got to see me play uh, in the way that I did. You know, um, in her, in her lifetime, I'm sure yeah. she wherever she is, she she's seen it and and understands it. But she never got to see me. So that was that was I was going for a real tough period as a as a young man as well because no, I was. Bro, I'm feeling that period. You know, I was I'm 21, like, and I know people lo yeah. lose their their parents a lot younger. Yeah. Some you know when they're kids they lose their parents, but that was that was hard for me. You know, oh, coming man. back and, and and seeing her in in bro, you know. I just buried my mum. So just listening to you talking about your mum and stuff, and I'm. My mum had cancer as well. It just makes me just think how you must have felt. Do you know what I mean? And just thoughts going through your head, whether you've been there enough. And it's, uh, it's messy, isn't it? Bro? Yeah. And, he, and then even after that, you know, I, I was, um, I'd always been taught by my, 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 my family that, uh, I say my, my family, my grandparents, and even when you get into football, people always say to, you know, make sure you save for a rainy day, make sure you do this, make sure yeah. you do that. And I came off the rails a little bit. Oh, yeah, at at that stage, around that time, because what had happened was I was thinking, all that could, was going through my mind was, is this woman that's done all? She's given her life, yeah, literally given her life for yeah, me and my bro. sister, and I got put thrust into a position where I could change her life, and just as I could change her life, she's not there no more. So then it was like, oh, what's it all about? Yeah. You know, what am I saving for? Well, 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 you know, I could be gone tomorrow. What am I saving for? So then it was it, it was probably at that point I, I kind of like said to myself, do you know what? I am going to save, but I'm going to make sure I enjoy life as well. Mm. And sort of like losing my mum when I did kind of just changed my whole perspective on life and the way the way it should be lived and, and, and how yeah. you should behave and what okay. you should do. So you kind of let go of the reins yeah. a bit, like whatever, in it. Yeah. So what kind of things, what was your vices? What kind of things you find yourself not being disciplined in? That And did it start affecting football at any time at all? Um, I just, I think I became, and I wasn't probably, uh, probably wasn't uh, vices. I just probably became frivolous with money. 
Okay. And just spent it. Got you. You know, without, you know, with the thought process that everyone mm -hmm. was saying to me, save, save, save That's for a it. rainy day. Yeah. I was saying, well, here's a rainy day and I can't do nothing about it. I've oh, got you. Do you know what yeah, I mean? because mum died. Here's young. my biggest rainy day I've ever had in my yeah. life and I couldn't do nothing. Don't matter what I've got yeah. saved up, I can't do nothing about oh, yeah, it. Yeah. You know, so kind of oh, came off the rails a little bit for a while. Yeah. Um, but then... How long do you think it took you to kind of like start coming back around, bro? Probably, probably a year. After a year, I, I started... I started to think to myself, what would she want? Mm. What would she want for me? Beautiful. And that was it. Then that was the that was the the crowning moment. What you would know, she want think, for me? I think this moment, as you're talking about it, is people going to be watching that's lost loved ones, people that's going through this pain and hurt, cancer, um, you know, COVID and all sorts of things. And I think that's a real positive thing to change the way that we're seeing things. Yeah, hundred percent. Because listen to what you said. It's like how you processed your mum's passing was like, well, you know, what's the point? Yeah. Saving my mum's gone now, this is what I was doing it for. That was the rainy day and there's no point now. Yeah. And you changed that to, well, let me do it for mum. Yeah, exactly. And make this about mum. Yeah. So, you know, if she was with me now, I want to make her proud. Exactly. That. So let me do everything. So I just want to encourage people to do everything they can do to make that person that they love proud. Of yeah. them. And that's important. That's yeah. very important because you know what they want for you. You know what they would have wanted. I know that's what my mum would have wanted for me. I know. And, well, and it wouldn't have been, wanted. she wouldn't have wanted it for me to give to her. She would just wanted my life to be different to hers. That's correct, bro. You know, and, and that's, and, and so that's been, a, that's always been a motivating factor for me. Aye. So we end up changing to serve you. Yeah. You, you change the meaning. Yes. So from the mind, you change how, what it meant to you, and it began to serve you on your journey to become greater than you was. Yep, exactly that. Beautiful, man, to reach your goals. Mm. And did you, by now, have any set goals in your head, like, I want to do this or I want to do that? Yeah, I think the, the, the goals I had in my head was I wanted to play for England. Um, the reason being is, is I think when you, when you come into any sport... Um, and there's a there's an opportunity to represent your country. That mm. means you've got to the highest. It's probably the highest accolade you can you mm. can attain as a as a sportsman yeah, in football. To know that you know, you know when 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 you think about I I, I did I spoke to someone a, a, mm. a while back, and this was a long while ago, and they said there was there was 60 million people in this country at the time. I know there's more now. But at the time of speaking to this person, there was about 60 million people in this country. And he asked me, how many of those people do you think played football at any level? And I was like, 10 million, 15 million. No, he said close to 30 million people. And we're talking about from uh, playing football in a school yeah, playground, the school level. team, right. right up until professional yeah. football. Mm, wow. And he said, and at one stage, you was chosen as one of the best 11 of those 30 million people. Wow. In your position. Wow, that's And dope. he said, and even trimmed down to your position. Wow. And you, you, was, you, was, you was chosen as well. So at the time of me thinking, like, you know, it's the, probably the highest accolade you can get in, in any, any sport is to play for your country, you know, to, to, to get... And when he broke it down like that, you go, that's wow. Right. It's that's hell of right. an achievement. Yeah, You know, you, pro you probably take it for granted. Yeah. And I probably did. Yeah. But then when you... Break it down and you think it about it. It's a hell, yeah. of a hell of an achievement. I, I think I just took a lot of what I'd done for granted coming up. Yeah. Because I just looked at it as, well, what else am I going to do? I can't let my kids down. So I've got to change my life. Mm. So I need to train every day, run every day, just stay focused, stop taking drugs and messing up myself and just, just get somewhere in my life for my children yeah. and change my life around. But it wasn't until I had an injury and I was laid up that I sat there and think, what did you just now do? You went from being homeless at 15 to being number one in the world and fighting for a world title. And, and you, you, you only had nine amateur fights. You turned pro in one season and got to 18 fights undefeated, 15 knockouts before the best in the world in your weight division beat you and stopped that run. Mm. Well, Come on, man, give yourself some, some credit. credit. Yeah, and it was only then when I was lying down <laughs> did I realise what yeah. I'd done. Jeez. I was so driven and just focused on trying to get out of the mess I was in mentally and financially and everything that I did, wasn't really paying attention to what I was actually doing. 
You know, it's it's really it's really funny. I'm listening to what you're saying there, and, and what saying just sparked in my head. You know, uh, when you said about taking drugs. You know, I, I grew up on a council estate. I grew, I grew up in Labour Grove, and the front line in Labour Grove yeah, was a place right. where everybody used to go and buy, buy buy their drugs. Yeah. And you know, some of my friends used to take drugs. Mm. Um, and I always remember my. I, it's really weird because having some of the chats I had with my dad and some of the things he'd said to me. One of the things he'd said to me, he said, "If you ever get yourself involved with the police." where you get to detained in the police station. He said, I'll bail you out once, I'll bail you out twice, I won't bail you out a third time. Wow. So he, always, he almost gave me a pass. I want to meet your dad. Right? He almost gave me a pass to say, he, to, to say I could do these things. Mm. But you know what? So much respect for my mum. Yeah. That it would have killed me, if literally. You could, if you had done that to your mum. It would have killed me to see my mum have to come and bail me out of the police station. Yeah, never that. And I said, I, I've made a promise to myself, the one thing, listen, yeah. you could be driving down the road in your car and someone mm -hmm. runs out in front of you and you run somebody over and you yeah. end up you end up in, in a police station. Mm -hmm. But my mum was never ever going to come and bail me out of prison because I've been in someone's house yeah. or I've stolen That's from it. someone or I'd knocked someone. That's you know, I'm selling drugs and all that. Never, never. I made, I made, that, I made that pact with myself. Yeah. And I thank God, yeah, you I thank God that I was able to hold on Beautiful. to that. And she's never been, yeah, she never had to precious, do that, man. you know. And, 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 you know, I say my mum, my granddad, I had so much respect yeah. for them, them that the last thing I wanted to do was let them down. I was mm. the first grandchild. I'm the first grandchild. Wow. So I was never going to let them so down. So important, man. You know? Like, I hear family yeah. all the time. There's this thread. Yeah. You know, and I think it's so important, like, families, connections. And yeah. we see a lot of broken families nowadays yeah. in the 21st century. And it's become the norm. Yeah. And, you, you know, know? My, my family was broken. My mum and dad was broken. Yeah, do you know I what hear I mean? you. But we can sometimes use that as an excuse for us to go and do the things that got you, we want to we wanna go, yeah. and, you know, and, and blame it the fact that I ain't got mm. a dad, to blame it the fact that I ain't got a mum. And yeah. I know the dad's an important factor in the house and yeah, anybody's yeah. household. Excellent. But, yes. you know, there's choices. And I used to say to my mates, and I, said to, I say to people now, you know, I was up in, I was in, up in uh, uh, West Brom mm. uh, a little while back and for Sir, uh, the late Sir Regis's yeah. wife, yeah. she's carrying on his legacy and, 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 and stuff that he, he, he was doing in the community. Mm. Mm. And... Guy introduced me and said, "Oh, this is Les Sir Les Ferdinand, you know, in the top ten of goal scorers in the Premier League." This, this gave me a really glowing introduction, mm. and all these kids were there and they was clapping. I came on the stage and I said to him, "Look, thank you very much for for that introduction. It's fantastic and seeing all these people clap it, you know, makes you realise what you've done in your careers. You know, it it, it it's yeah. been appreciated." Yeah. But I want every one of these kids to hear uh, here to understand. I come from where you come from. That's right. So whatever you see me here and however you you view me in your in your mindset, yeah. I come from where you come from. Yeah, yeah. yeah I lived on a council estate. Yeah, I lived it. on with a, with a single That's parent. It. That's it. Doesn't you know you get you, you go it down the road. Define you. It doesn't define you. You go down the road and you know if you go left, where you're gonna go. Mm -hmm. But if you turn right, it may open up avenues Trust that you me. never ever realised yeah. that you could you can yeah. achieve. And I'm living proof of that. Living proof. Because I you know I've got some friends that turned left. That's right. Yeah, I turned left with my friends and decided I don't like the ended where the left is taking me. So let me quickly run back. <laughs> right. so I went back the other yeah, way. You know, and so we, we have those choices. We yeah. get to a stage in our life where we, 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 we have to make those choices. Yeah. And unfortunately, too many go, go left. And That's right. Some of them, like yourself, come mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. Some of them don't. And they just go yeah. deeper and deeper and deeper yeah. into that into yeah. that abyss. Yeah, man. You it's know, powerful, isn't it? Yeah, it's powerful. It the the powerful. fact that you understand that, you know what, it's it's not just about single parents and broken homes. There's still an opportunity. There's still hope. There's still a chance. Sometimes we do say that and we talk about, like, you know, that's the reason. But there's always going to be broken homes. There's always going to be single parents. And if you look at the most successful people, yeah. that's where they, they come, come from. from. Exactly. The greatest people that we look up to and talk about, look at their backgrounds. Yeah. It's come from the toughest backgrounds. It's almost like that's the breeding ground. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because it, it, the, going through fire strengthens and develops the greatness in you. But you said choice. So the choice is you choosing to embrace it and keep going instead of giving up 
and listening to all the excuses that you hear all around you. Oh, this is the ends, man. What choice have I got? Yeah. All them talk about the system mm -hmm. and, and racism and everything else. Listen, bro, we, we, we were getting controlled, beaten, battered, raped and abused for years exactly. and still has come through that and become been, been mighty individuals have come from that. So there is no excuse about your background. There is no excuse about where you're from. Only you can make that excuse. Only you. Yeah. Only you can make that excuse. That's beautiful. Because we, 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 as you, all the things you just spoken about there, you know, we, we our, our countries have been raped, pillaged, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and and destroyed. Yeah. But we've still come out of it powerful. How did you come out of that? Because I know you had to taste your fair share of that. You're one of the early ones, bruv, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, there was pioneers before you, but you were still in that early section. Yeah. Uh, you know, how was you dealing with that? How cool was you about it? Um, you know, I, I, I always, I always feel myself for being fortunate that, you know, the likes of the late Sir Regis, Laurie Cunningham, yeah. the late Laurie Cunningham, Brendan Batson, these guys, uh, the stuff that they went through, Vince Lear and John Barnes, and mm. I, never had, I never had bananas thrown on the picture. I hear you, know, you I had bro. racist abuse come through years ago, yeah. and I always say to the guys now, nowadays, you know, I said years ago, for someone to racially abuse me, okay, yeah, they can do it from the stands. Because in the t uh, back in the day, people could chant monkey chants. They could they could call you whatever they wanted mm. to, and then they walk out the stadium with their mates and say, "See you next week." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Catherine, see you next week. Yeah. We'll be another stadium. Yeah. And that's changed now. I hear because, you. Because of CCTV footage in in in, in stadiums mm. and stuff like it, and and some of the things that they they've employed and put in place, mm. it's not acceptable in stadiums anymore. Gotcha. I said, but years ago, when someone wanted to racially abuse me or wanted to have a go at me, they would have to write a letter, put whatever they wanted in that letter, put a stamp on it, address it to the football club, <laughs> yeah. go to the post box, <laughs> and send it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nowadays, they can sit right here. Yeah, and, sit down, on tweet a couple words, and that's it. You know, bash away on the tibbly tabbly you know, you know, on the buttons. So it was a lot more rigmarole that someone had to go to to racially abuse me back in the day now, Got you. As, we, as we're seeing on, on, on a regular basis, yeah. and it's just done over the phone. Mm. Um, but, you know, it was really strange because those kind of things used to make me stronger. Yeah, I get you. You know, because I knew I was doing something that was upsetting you. Mm. And what I wanted to do was do it even more. I wanted, to, I wanted yeah. to upset you even more. Did you take it out on the, the goal in the net, just yeah. scoring more goals? 100%. 100%, that's what I wanted to do. Yeah, keep saying that, okay, watch me, I'm going to score another you know, goal. Uh, you know, in the end, um, you know, it's, it's well documented that I've, I've spoken about Everton on, on many occasions because that was where I, I, I got a lot of racist abuse and mail from. Yeah. Um, and if you look at my goal scoring record against Everton in about 17 Beautiful. games, I've scored 15 goals. So thank like all the you fans know, that wrote you those <laughs> lovely even, even I've got some, racist letters. I've got some mates who. Um, who've got some friends who are Everton supporters and they used to go, oh, they used to come to town and I'll go, oh, our supporters started to hammer you. I was like, oh, please shut up because he's going to score if you do that. He's going to score. Don't <laughs> wind him up. He's going to get us. Uh, you know, I, I used to say I should have played against some part because I saw the score time and he got a goal. I tell you. I would have been, tell you, man. been a legend there in the end. But, you know, Excellent. That's, that's what it was back in the day. I say back in the day, still, yeah, still here today. Of course, of course. You know, I was 100% backing you mm. with the whole knee thing because I saw that, you know what, in a way, Les, like, you to me is like a silent, powerful, you and John Barnes, mm. yeah, like you're so on point and knowledgeable and understand the system and what you've been through that you get it that, you know, it's no point going on and on about all these different issues. What are we going to do? Exactly. What changes can we make? Mm -hmm. And how are we going to go about these changes? Yeah, we could do kick it out. Yeah, we could go on the knee. We could do all of these stuff that's created organisations that money's filtering into. But where's the change, bro? Yeah. And I ain't seen the change <laughs> and I ain't seen the money creating the change, which is supposed to have people at the decision-making table, which is supposed to have black people as managers because they want to be and they're good enough to be, but they're not being allowed the opportunity to be uh, on the director's table. And so, you know, I just look up to you in, in, in another level when I saw those things come out and the way you conducted yourself and spoke on the matter. And I said, 
you know, we need more brothers like this just speaking calmly and unafraid of the pressure that the media tries to put on them and tries to make you look bad. Yeah, and, and not not just not just the media, but you know, our, our our own people. Because when I when I said it, you know, there was a lot of black people that come out. Oh, no, he's talking, he's talking rubbish. You know, he's blah 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 blah. And I know, I know, I know what I know what the gesture means. Yeah, I know, I understand it. Of course. And but what I was saying was. Let's call for action. Yeah. Well, what's well, next? Because you know, what, how long are we going to take the knee for? Yeah. Another another ten years, another year, and everyone goes, yeah. Look, they're still allowing them mm -hmm. to take the knee. Mm -hmm. But I'm not seeing no change in football. You know, I, you know, I went to do a, 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 I went on one of these the TV shows last week, and they asked me to to put a, 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 a no discriminate. I went, no, I am racist. So why am I going to put a badge on? I said, what are you telling me to put? I'm not putting another badge. I'm not putting another T-shirt mm -hmm. on. I don't want to. Mm -hmm. Show me action. And tell me to wear Show another me badge. Some. I said, I've been wearing badges for 30 years. Exactly. And I'm still in the same place. Still in the same place. You know? Black people are still in the same place in this exactly. industry. So stop stop trying to gloss over it. And, you know, the forays have said, yeah, take the knee. And, yeah, it looks great. It does. Looks, it looked powerful for mm -hmm. a while. But now... People are going down and they're forgetting to do it. That's it. You know the amount, amount of amount of managers, right? The amount of managers and coaches mm -hmm. that called me afterwards and went, "Les, you said the right thing, but we can't say it because yes. we're white, yeah, yeah. and they'll think we're racist." Yeah. So I'm saying, so really, what you're doing, you're going down on one knee, but you don't really want to do really it. Don't really want to. Exactly. So you're doing it just. Yeah. And that's that's what and I'm the trying to get away from. change has to come from here, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly. Exactly. It's got to come from your mind, so you've got to get it. Yeah. Like, no, this is inequality. Inequality is not right. Mm. I think everybody should be playing on the same level um, playing field. Level field. Mm. And it's what Martin asks for, for everybody to be treated. We're human beings. Yeah, exactly. You shouldn't be looked at and graded on the shade of your skin colour. Exactly. But just the, the quality that you bring to the table. Yeah, exactly. Period. And that's and I, what And I think sometimes for. people look at me and think, oh, because he's, got, he's in the position he's in, He's saying these things. If he wasn't, he wouldn't say that. But I'm saying, no, no matter where I was, and you, I think you yeah. know my principles are Trust always my me, principles. Man. And they, they, they'll always remain the yeah. same. Yeah, and you're I, a and real I, one. And I see, I see things from, for the way it is. Yeah. And not, not just because people say, oh, this is good. I'm going to go, yeah, this is good. That's it. it ain't good. That's it. So, 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 so before we kind of start wrapping up, if you could kind of, in a nutshell, share with me QPR... Moving on to kind of Tottenham, I saw you playing mm -hmm. with Tottenham, and tell me a little bit about the dynamics with with players, who the best players that you played with. Uh, maybe I might have had a fight in the changing room. Not that <laughs> I see you maybe as that kind of player, but just give me some juicy stuff that you know, <laughs> some real truths yeah, that really helped you on your journey as well. Because everything that you go through is something, an opportunity to learn and grow from. Yeah, isn't it? of course. You know, you know, it's, you know, we're talking about this racism, so. So like I remember, you know, one of one of the the clubs that I had one of my most successful times was at Newcastle. Okay, you know, when really? I left when I left QPR yeah. went to, to Newcastle, you know, we we, we the, the first year I was here, we should have won the league in in terms of the points tally that we had, yeah. and we let it slip. Okay. And the, you know, I was there for two years. We finished second in the league two yeah. years. First year we should have we should have wiped the floor yeah. with it. But you know, it was really strange because I went to. Uh, Newcastle, and I always remember one of the things I do remember about Newcastle was one stage when John Barnes was playing for Liverpool, and racism was allowed in the stadiums to to rear its ugly head. At half time, they took three and a half bin liners of bananas off the pitch. What? Three and a half bin liners of uh, bananas off the pitch. So when I went to Newcastle, I went to play. Right, and you ask anybody, you ask any Geordie about Les Ferdinand at Newcastle. Right, and, and and the way I'm seen. Yeah. I went there with a mindset that not everybody in the, in this crowd has changed their mindset from when John Barnes played there. That's it. it. Right? Yeah. But I've got to go there and be me. Yeah. And do what I'm capable of doing. Okay. I've joined this football club to, mm -hmm. to play football and score goals, yeah. and that's what I did. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, and, you know, if, if you ask anybody about Les Ferdinand and Newcastle and his time, and you ask the Geordie, they'll go, yeah, he's brilliant for us. Brilliant, he was man. fantastic, and so I you. you know, I changed I changed quite a few people's mindsets. Awesome, um, but you know, listen, I, I just never forget where I come from. You know, I went I went back to Tottenham. It was mm. it was a club I always supported as a boy. Yeah, and if there was anywhere that I wanted to go and score goals, mm -hmm. it was there. And but injuries and everything else came into play. Loss of form, and yeah. probably wasn't as successful as I, I wanted I to be wanted at, to at, at Spurs. Yeah. But 
you know, I look back on my career now and think, what a I, wonderful career, I man. did what I could do, you know. Probably Seriously. didn't win as much as I wanted to win. Yeah. But, um... How mad is it that the club you was at in the early days, you're involved in decision-making, mm -hmm. the football and the board and all that Yeah, now. you know, I, I'm very thankful to, to the owners and they're an ethnic minority board. Yeah, And I'm very, are. very thankful to them for yeah. giving me the opportunity to do it. Um, because I'm not sure I would have got that opportunity anywhere else. else. As much as people call me Soleres and this, that, and the yeah, other, yeah. Um, I'm not sure I would have been afforded that opportunity anywhere yeah. else. And I don't, you know. And it's one of the things that journalists come and ask me. They say, "Do you, you know, because of the fact there's, uh, do you see yourself as a pioneer for other black young professionals or yeah. whatever wanting to to get into the role?" And I said, and, and, and because of that reason, mm -hmm. do you feel you need to be successful? I said, I need to be successful because anything I do, I want to be successful at it. That's right. Yeah. And I know loads of people that have done this job, who loads of my peers and people in, in the same position as me that have done it at three or four or five different clubs. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is, if I'm not deemed to be successful at, new, at QPR, I never get an opportunity to do it again. Whereas all these other guys seem to go from club to club to club. And why? Go. Because they've been successful. No, because some of them haven't been successful, that's right. but they've been given another opportunity. Mm -hmm. Number you opportunity, know, so and that's all that's These needed. are all the things we're talking about, you know, yeah. and, and, and these are the mindsets that we're trying to change right now. That's right, my man. But I, I just think that is such an awesome, beautiful story. Mm. It's like poetic. It's like that, just go from a club that you had played for to be on the board like that. And um, I think the supporters, Really, have got your, you know, your back. Some of them, yeah. Some <laughs> yeah. Of them good, listen, what, listen, one one thing you do realize is, and and, and I think where where I have to be um, fair, yeah. I think anywhere that there's a director of football, if things are not going right at the That's club, right. you're looked at. And of so course. I was Celeste when I left. I might be a little bit different now. Some supporters may see me differently because yeah. the club has not been as successful as mm -hmm. they would like it to be. Yeah, yeah. But we've gone through a lot of changes. That's right. Um, and it's continuing to change. And hopefully we we'll, we can bring success, some successful times so. back to, to the football Charlie club. Austin in. Yes. Um, Your Hanson as well. So, yeah. yeah you know, yeah. we've had to change. You know, our policies uh, had to change from what it was four or five years ago. Okay. And that's not because I've come through the door and said, like, we need to change the policy. Mm. It's just we couldn't do what we was doing, you know, and um, we've had to change it. Do you know what, bro? I read something in, in the online about something about them changing Sir Les. What's all that about? You're still Sir Les? <laughs> Is, are you still yeah, Sir Les? Yeah, yeah, they still call me that, yeah. yeah. So, so, so what do they do? Do they change, do they take the knighthood away? What no, do they do? well, you know, listen, you know, everyone say, it's really funny because everyone thinks I'm a sir. Um, I'm not. It's just what I've been called throughout my footballing okay, career. Okay. So I've never had the night, but I've I've got an MBE, which is a bit of a dem the, yeah. demotion from the the the, the night. I'll call you but, Yeah, but they um, you know, it's a, it's just a it's a name that followed me um, when I was at QBR. Yeah. I went to Turkey, it's and it's followed me all from my career. I've Beautiful. been called a, I've been called a lot worse at times when I well, played I'll against rival what, opposition. I hope the Queen's listening. <laughs> and I'd like to let her know that just uh, make sure that my man gets knighted. Everyone's. Loving and respecting Les. So I, I believe that you should have that night on Les. Trust <laughs> maybe, me. maybe one day. Yeah, man, I hope so. Well, man, this time with you has been absolutely fantastic. I've enjoyed every minute of it. The energy, the vibes. I'm sure a lot of people are going to sit and enjoy this as well. And a lot of young people watching and who've got to really see the steps, the footsteps and the footprints of the people that's gone before them. I think it's important for them to see this on, on their journey because they're coming from the estates, they're coming from the ends and they need to be able to see that guys like yourself have done this and you've shown the model, you've shown the blueprint mm -hmm. and um, I really hope and pray that they can get a lot from this man. And yeah, um, you know, that's why I, I, you know, I admire what you do and how you do it and, and who you bring it to and, um, and it's important that people like myself who, who do come from the ends and, 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 and lived in the ends for a lot mm. of their life, yeah. come back and show people that there you go. there's not just one way. That's right. Sir Les Ferdinand, give him a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks, Les. Nice one, mate.